I've been waiting two years to say the following, and I hope that you have been waiting two years to give the proper response. Okay, you ready? Good evening, everybody. All right, welcome to the varsity. Welcome to LSU Science Cafe. I am Steve Beck with the Office of Research and Economic Development. I am so glad to see you all here, to be here with you and to share the work that we do at LSU. It's really, um, it's just good. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, if you do uh, feel like patronizing the bar in the back, please do at any time. We encourage you to do that. Um, but I'm really excited to welcome not only you to this program, but to the vast multitudes on Facebook Live who are watching us as well. Let's give a round of applause for all of them. Not sure exactly how many we have, but it's at least five, I'm sure. Um, well, tonight's program features Dr. Rob Brumfield, who is the curator of genetic resources at the LSU Museum of Natural Science. He's gonna share with you the story of how bird species originated and evolved. He studied the diversification of birds in Central and South America throughout his career. Tonight's event is brought to you in partnership with local par public radio station, WRKF 89.3 FM, your source for programs like Science Friday, the TED Radio Hour and Hidden Brain. You can see the entire program schedule at wrkf.org. We really thank them for their, for their uh, collaboration and, we're, and tonight's event is being fed over their Facebook Live channel. Um, so WRKF will be giving away an NPR beverage tumbler to one lucky audience member here tonight, and we'll announce the winner at the end. So stick around. Um, without further ado, uh, let me introduce Dr. Dr. Brumfield. Rob Brumfield earned his PhD in, zo in zoology from the University of Maryland. As a graduate fellow with the Smithsonian Institution, he studied the outcome of hybridization between two species of mannequins in Panama. After completing his thesis research, Dr. Brumfield shifted his focus to Bolivia, where he studied hybrid, hybridizing ant, uh, ant birds. In 2003, he joined the curators and faculty at the Museum of Natural Science and the Department of Biological Sciences, where he is focused on reconstructing the bird tree of life and understanding evolutionary processes that resulted in 10,000 species within the tree. Afterwards, we'll have a question and answer session and we hope that, and we expect that you'll be participating in that. So thank you very much. Without further ado, Dr. Rob Brumfield. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, so welcome. I'm a bird guy, uh, which basically means that if you open my iPhone and look at my roll of photos, expecting to see family photos and that kind of stuff. It's just reams and reams and reams of birds. And, uh, you know, is that right, baby? Yeah, okay, that's right. Um, you know, and um, we may be walking on campus together and we're having a conversation and you notice that I'm sort of not paying attention because it's a Wilson's warbler sort of singing in the background. And then I'm gonna tell you about the Wilson's warbler, of course. Um, uh, and then like two weeks ago, I was driving down uh, River Road and I found the first uh, record of lesser Nighthawk for East Baton Rouge Parish. You should all be very impressed with that. Thank you. That was actually a big deal. Anyway, um, so a few years ago, uh, let's say maybe three years ago now, it's sort of hard to remember with the pandemic and everything, but we got a really nice grant from the National Science Foundation to build the tree of life of all birds. And that's the 10,000 to 11,000 extant bird species plus all of the extinct ones. And so we have a big international team um, and we're using a lot of DNA genomic technologies to, to build this tree. So basically the job is to gather samples from all 
10 or 11,000, depending on how you define species, birds, and then sequence their genomes. And then you use high performance computing clusters to work the magic and spit out the tree. And then we also have paleontologists who study the extinct birds to sort of place them into the tree. Um, so probably my next science cafe in a few years will be done with that tree, but we're not quite there yet. So I thought what I'd do today is talk about some of the circumstances that put us at LSU in the position to be able to ask NSF for um, a big grant to build the bird tree of life. And then also talk about some of the things that we've learned since I took ornithology about the origin of birds. And then I wanna also talk about um, how new species are formed because I think a lot of people think it's sort of um, species, you know, the, the process of new species is sort of a done thing, but really it's happening right now all around us in the world. So next slide, please. Uh, could you go back? I'm sorry. One more. Yeah. Okay. So um, I want to talk a little bit about ornithology at the Museum of Natural Science, in case you don't know. So George Lowry founded the museum in the 50s, a remarkable natural historian, really founded it out of nothing. And, um, and built it into an amazing research collection and also it has a, a nice public exhibits area that, that you can still attend. Beginning in, uh, say, the 60s, um, they started taking research expeditions to Central America. And then in the 70s, John O'Neill, who's a famous ornithologist, uh, came to LSU for grad school. And that sort of kicked off uh, a real age of discovery of doing these big expeditions, primarily to Peru, but also to Bolivia. And in those days, uh, I mean, it, it was fairly routine that they would find on these trips, new species to science. It was just like, you know, not super routine, but like you had a pretty decent chance. And so what happened is graduate students flocked to LSU pun intended, from around the world to, uh, to go, you know, get this educational opportunity that you really could not get anywhere else. And that tradition continues to this day. So every year we do, in the bird group, we do at least one, maybe two expeditions to usually the tropical regions. But the same is also true for our friends in memology and herpetology, one of places in Indonesia and New Guinea. All right, so that's sort of uh, one important thing. Another important thing is that in 1979, Herb Dessauer, who was a biochemist and herpetologist at the LSU Med School, um, basically you know, told people at the museum, you know, when you go on these expeditions, you ought to be bringing a liquid nitrogen tank with you and flash freezing the tissue samples in nitrogen. And in those days, it was so that you could do protein analyses. No one was doing DNA work in those days. And so you can see on the right there, what we call a little liquid nitrogen dewer. It's just a little 10 liter tank. This was for a short trip to Coiva Island off the uh, Pacific coast of Panama a few years ago. You know, but for some of these two months trips, you know, we might have uh, two giant 20 liter tanks on a mule train up into the Andes, you know, we would get these tanks to where they needed to go. However, you know, we needed to do it. It was on the back, donkey, mule, um, often a person. All right, so then you fast forward to the, you know, this technological revolution that we're living in that's bringing us iPhones and TikTok and electric cars and all this sort of stuff. The same revolution has happened in DNA sequencing in the world of genomics. So that now it's relatively trivial and relatively inexpensive to sequence an entire genome of a bird. And so now that tissue collection that we have, which is now in the neighborhood of 100,000 bird tissues all over there at Foster Hall in liquid nitrogen vapor freezers, 
we now are in a perfect position to be able to propose using those samples to reconstruct the tree of life of all birds. And there are other tissue collections you know, like this around the world, but LSU's is, as far as I know, the oldest and the largest for birds. And so for this crowd, it really should be a point of pride. We have premier uh, program in natural history, ornithology, I think the third largest um, bird, university associated bird research collection and the largest tissue collection. Next slide. All right, so um, yeah, we do a lot of publicity at the museum and a lot of it is look at this new species we found and it sort of gets almost routine, but you know, this is just an example of not just a new species, this is a new genus, okay? And when a scientist, a taxonomist tells you it's a new genus, that means there's nothing like close to it, okay? It's like you look at it and you go, I can't figure out what this thing is closely related to. So this is Xenoglox um, Lowryi, named after George Lowry, discovered in, in Peru in the 70s. I don't have a picture of it, but just it was either last year, I think it was, was it last year that a new genus of tanager was described by LSU ornithologists. So this tradition um, continues. There's a lot of just basic biodiversity. Like you would think that by now we would know all of the bird species out there, but that's definitely not the case. All right, next slide. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit. What is a bird? All right, so... Um, I think when you see a chicken without feathers, you can definitely see some sort of reptilian thing going on right there. So it's not too surprising that, um, you know, there is a, a reptilian history and sort of an inside joke in the natural history museum is that, you know, even though you've got your ornithology and your herpetology and your mammalogy, the ornithologists are really part of herpetology, right, Chris? Yeah, I mean, the birds are just a, a subsection of that. But at any rate, when I took ornithology, you know, the, the, you know, the distinguishing feature was the feather, right? Nothing else has feather. And you could trace back the origin of birds to Archaeopteryx, which was a, a beautifully preserved fossil discovered a couple of years after Origin of Species was published. Um, you know, and it's a perfect transitional fossil. It's a, it's a bird with feathers, but it has teeth and the tail. So exactly the sort of transition. Um, and so what um, has changed is that there have been a slew of fossils discovered really in the last 20 years that have dramatically changed the view of sort of early bird evolution and really like sort of how does one sort of separate bird from theropod dinosaur. So I'm not up on dinosaurs, um, but my son Caleb is. So I thought I'd have him come up here and, and uh, riff a little bit about dinosaurs. And if you have any dinosaur questions, I'm going to refer you to Caleb. All right, next slide. When you look at the, um, fam like the family, tree of birds and other animals such as the dinosaurs and crocodilians. They're all part of one large group called the archosaurs, which emerged in the late Permian. And if you can look at the family tree, the closest living relative of birds is none other than crocodiles and alligators. So if you go out to one of the rivers, you see an egret and an alligator, those are the last two remaining archosaur groups. So bird phy phylogeny, along with looking at this tree, you'll notice how close they are to certain dinosaur groups, such as the Deinonychosauria, which is a dromaeosaur group. Like think the Velociraptor, Utah Raptor, all those guys. And of course, you've got your more traditional dinosaurs like the Ceratosaurs, which were the large, generally Jurassic dominant predators and the carnosaurs, which came, which were around at the same time, but came a bit later. But yeah, because, and of course, the ornithischians, ornithischians are the least 
closely related to birds because of their hip structure, which is different from the Saurischian dinosaurs, which is sauropods and theropods, despite the Ornithischian hip structure being ironically coined bird hip. Uh, next slide, please. And if you look at the hand structure of a of Deinonychus, a dromaeosaur, Archaeopteryx, the sort of stem bird and a modern chicken, you'll notice that all three of them have lost their fourth and fifth digits. Even though the chickens has completely, de the other digits have completely degenerated at this point to form a wing structure, you'll notice that the vestigial part is still somewhat there. And you can note the similarities between Deinonychus, Archaeopteryx, and Nothurus, the modern bird. Uh, next slide. And if you look at uh, Gwen Yuan Long, a species of Dromaeus, uh, a genus of Dromaeus, actually, which was related to Velociraptor, which occurred in China in the early Cretaceous period was not in fact a scaly lizard animal like in Jurassic Park. Of course, Michael Crichton eventually came up with a plot device to sort of fix that. He said it was, it was to make the dinosaurs look more marketable <laughs> instead of just accepting that he got it wrong. <laughs> and if you look at this animal, it's nothing like a big, scary crocodile lizard thing. It's covered in feathers and kind of looks like a hawk or a turkey, something in that vein. And it wasn't just them that had feathers. In fact, and a lot of fossils recently discovered, like think late 90s, early 2000s, including the famous Sinoceropteryx, which was a dinosaur fossil that had feather imprints and coloration preserved, proving that it had a raccoon-like striped tail and orange coloration on its body, along with the feathers. Uh, next slide, please. Here we look at a somewhat modern looking bird from early Cretaceous China called Falcatacali, which was absolutely covered in feathers like as, as the defining features of bird are. You can tell that that is a bird because it has everything that says bird on it. It has the beak, it has feathers, it has the shortened tail, it has the feet structure. But even though feathers, you think, when you look at feathers, you think bird. You think little, cute little animal or big bird of prey, though not enormous, it's still threatening. You don't think, next slide. The largest feathered animal ever discovered, a genus of Tyrannosaur from the same area at the same time, Euteranus, 30 feet long, and the top predator was completely covered in feathers. Thank you, Caleb. All right. Any other, yeah, those names of dinosaurs, I just don't know. All right, next slide. All right, we're gonna switch from the very beginning of bird origins. I wanna talk about the process called speciation, which is the formation of new bird species. And I mentioned earlier, this is something that's happening all the time, okay? It's a very dynamic process. New species are forming as we speak. So the, you know, probably the most famous example of speciation is on the Galapagos Islands, right? Darwin visited there. You've got different finches on the different islands. And basically what I want you to remember is that for speciation to happen, there's really just a couple things, okay? You need to get geographic isolation of populations, right? So a population living on this island, Somehow some colonizers make it over here and you've got two populations now. And then the other ingredient you need is time. So over time, just with the genetic machinery we have to replicate our DNA, 
those populations are going to gradually diverge. You can think about it like the game of telephone. So imagine like, you know, that game where you, you say a phrase and you pass it around, pass it around. So imagine at some point in there, you just say, okay, you can never talk to each other again, but just keep the telephone going in your two separate pools, right? Add 10,000 years to that and compare what they're saying. I imagine it's going to be pretty different. There's another layer on it. Okay, so that's sort of just a neutral process, random change. You could add a natural selection effect, which is what's going on in the Darwin's Vinci. You imagine that when you're reciting this phrase on one island, there's a really high frequency noise in the background. So you have to sort of adjust your voice low. On the other island, there's a low frequency voice. So you have to noise, so you have to adjust your voice high. And so that natural selection would sort of enhance maybe the rate of change. The Darwin's Finches on Galapagos Island is a, sort of an odd situation because you have the geographic isolation there, which is an essential piece of it. But then you also have the fact that uh, these ground finches will adapt in terms of their bill to whatever the dominant seed is on the given island. So they have this sort of, you know, natural selection piece to it. And then the other twist to it is that the bill size affects their song, which is the, what they use in mate recognition, right? So you have this interesting thing where isolation, adaptation to different seeds affects the song. And so the speciation can happen relatively rapidly there. Next slide. All right, so um, what, where most of my work is, is in um, South America. And here we're looking at the Amazon River, which is at, at points is you know, tens of miles wide. You can barely see across it in parts. And what we found, and my geographers have known this a long time, is that the formation of the Amazon River system in the Amazon basin was a, a huge factor in isolating populations that eventually led to speciation. So before the Amazon basin was there, basically the Amazon was just a low swampy area. And then the Andes uplifted along the Western coast of South America. And when they did, it basically created a drainage and created this river system. Next slide. And one of the, the questions that you know, you always get is these are birds, okay? Can't they fly across the freaking river? You know, if you go stand by the Mississippi River, you'll want, you will see a Northern Cardinal cross it. All right, so it turns out birds that live in the dark understory of forests in the Amazon, like this little ant bird, okay? They've just brought it out into the middle of Chagres River in the Panama Canal zone and just let it go. And I think what you can see is it doesn't like fly to shore, it just crashes in. So there's something about, and then they catch it and release it that it's all okay. But there's something about light gaps. I mean, these birds that live in the dark understory, a river is basically an insurmountable barrier to them, okay? And so what I want you to think about is instead of like an archipelago as islands, think about patches of land in between rivers as an archipelago, next slide, like these toucans. So this is a, the distribution of a, um, a genus of toucans in South America. And what you should be able to see is that their distributions are basically sort of a little patchwork delineated by rivers, right? And so you think about like that game of telephone, you know, each one differs a little bit from each other. And so we can then go in and look at the genetics of these and find that, well, they've been isolated from each other for 2 million years, which is about the age of the Amazon basin, depending on, they put some big error bars on that. Next slide. All right, I wanted to find an example of speciation happening with a bird that everyone in this room has seen, the Northern Cardinal. Okay, so this is, is there anyone here who has not seen a Northern Cardinal? Okay, all right. I'm not want to admit it. All right, Amos Redbird. Okay, so the interesting thing about the Redbird is not only does it occur here in the Eastern United States, but it also occurs a little bit in Western US. 
um, and down in New Mexico. And there's a bunch of different uh, interesting variation in it that I'm not gonna get into today. But one thing that I wanna talk about is the fact that you could get on, so we're in Baton Rouge there, um, and I've got I-10 in red. So you could hop on I-10, head west, um, probably take you, I don't know, a day maybe, a day and a half, to where you get to that little patch where there are no northern cardinals. And that's basically the break between the Sonoran and the Chihuahua Desert. It's a well-known area where basically the you know, cardinals and a lot of other things just don't occur there. So that's the geographic isolation. And we know from genetic data that they have been isolated from each other and they look for all, I mean, they look just like Northern Cardinals. They've been isolated from each other for about a million years. So the question is, are they different species or are they not different species? And one thing you need to know, and we're not gonna get into it at all here is that systematists, people who study this sort of stuff, argue a lot about what a species is. We're not gonna worry about that. For our purposes, a species, you basically know you've reached species status when you no longer recognize another population as a potential mate, okay? That's gonna be our definition. So in this case, um, and this is a study from a few years ago by um, Kaya Provost at American Museum of Natural History, what, what she did is actually went out into the field and played the song of the Cardinals from Louisiana to the ones from Arizona that are a million, a million years divergent and vice versa to ask, do y'all recognize these or not? Basically, are we the same species or not? And let's play them. Could you play, let's play the, um, the one on the Eastern one and then play the one on the the, the Western one. I personally could not really tell a difference. <laughs> For me, they sound pretty similar. Now, the one in the West gives a little rattle call that I never hear in the one from the East. But what she found when she did these experiments is that they did not react to the other one. So in other words, if you are in Louisiana and play a Louisiana bird song to a Louisiana cardinal, it'll react. It'll be like, ah, you know, intruder the male will react. If you play it an Arizona song, it won't react. You may as well play it a cuckoo or something. You know, it's just not recognizing it as, as something to worry about. And so this is the earliest stages of speciation. Give this, you know, another, if it's, you know, assuming it's geologically and biogeographically stable, eventually these things will diverge in their plumage so that anyone would look at them and go, oh yeah, those are definitely different species. But this is the beginning of the process. This is happening in the cardinal. It's happening in your Carolina chickadees. It's happening in your blue jays. All these birds you know, have distributions that extend out into fingers elsewhere and they're geographically isolated populations. That's just part of sort of biogeography. And if the isolation can persist long enough so that those differences can accrue, then you can get new species. Next slide. So that is the process 
that results in the bird tree of life. So I'm just showing you some of the reams of tree of life. So we are about, I mean, probably 4,000 species into this thing. You can just sort of see what we're building is a giant record of the history of birds. So 10,500 or so bird species, and then all of the extinct ones. And the reason we wanna do that Obviously, we're just curious because we're birders and we want to know what's related to what. We want to figure out all the taxonomy, all that sort of stuff. But there are actually real, you know, applied reasons. So, for example, you may not know that birds are the official sort of model organism for learning about the neurological underpinnings of human speech. And, for example, they're very interested in, well, how many times in the bird tree of life did birds learn to mimic other birds? You know, learn mimicry turns out to be very similar to humans. And I think you could probably guess, and I'll end with this, what are the birds that know how to learn their songs? Birds that you can teach a song to or teach a word to. Parrots, that's one. Okay, things like minor birds. Okay, so that's part of a big group of birds called Ossine passerines. There's a third one that no one knows. And if you're an ornithologist in here, shut up. Hummingbirds are mimics, right? So you've got independent evolution of the neurological circuitry to learn how to sing a song, mimic to learn it from a parent or another bird. That's all I've got. I hope to be back in a few years with the complete bird tree of life and tell you all about that. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Dr. Maverick. The question is with regarding the two cardinals, is it known whether the two could mate and produce fertile offspring? And I, the answer, to that is I, I don't know, I don't, the, it, not in the wild, right? Because they're geographically isolated from each other. And then some people, not particularly with this, but have brought birds into captivity and you can sort of see if they're capable of um, producing offspring. The problem with the captive type experiments is that lots of things will interbreed in captivity and sort of, and so because of that, we're sort of left with these indirect arguments. So, so one strategy we'll use is, um, so for example, there's another species of cardinal called the vermilion cardinal. And we could ask, well, how genetically divergent is it from these two? You know, because no one is arguing that vermilion cardinal is not a good species. And you can sort of do a yardstick thing, but that, that's where you then may get into the arguments about, oh, that's a species, that's not a species, and da, 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 da. But it's a good question. Yes. So questions about sort of the pace of speciation and uh, sort of has basically, has it changed sort of prehistory versus now? Eh, that's a good question. Um, Let's see, uh, you know, the, it's such a slow process that, um, let me just try to take a stab at this. It's a slow process. Okay, so in Darwin's finches, speciation has been recorded to happen on the scale of a few years. That's a really unusual situation. The rest of bird world doesn't work like that. It usually is probably taking on the scale of a million years or more. And so when you think about sort of anthropomorphic, you know, human history, there just hasn't been, you know, that much time to be, you know, sort of influencing. I think the, you know, the biggest things we notice is, um, you know, sort of thinking about the Amazon. Okay, so if a river is a barrier, okay, so is a road, right? Um, and so if a, a river can create geographic isolation and then a million later you've got two species 
I guess in theory, the same thing could happen with a road. The only problem is, is that when you have the road, along with the road comes all the habitat degradation. So it's, um, I would say, yeah, it's, it's hard to, yeah, that's not a great answer, but I would say that, yeah, we don't really know. Uh, yeah, I, but I would say if anything, it, it's probably going to decrease speciation just through negative effects on, on wildlife. Any other questions? Yes. The temporal stability of the landscape has a, a big effect in terms of, you know, there, it has to be stable enough for there to be time to accrue these genetic differences to accrue in isolation. And if not, it doesn't happen. So. Any other questions? Let me get in the lights. Yeah, so um, the question is related to Andean valleys and sort of where where diversity might lie. And um, of course, you know, East Slope cloud forest is one of the richest biological places on the planet. Um, but if you're wanting to find new things, um, where I would go is outlying Andean ridges. So you've got the main Andes, okay? And then you'll, you know, you'll just have another little ridge that's out, say, a little further out into the, the Amazon, you know, basin, where basically there's an opportunity for isolation out there. And so that's one place to look for new things. You mentioned valleys, dry intermontane valleys is another place because they're patchily distributed in the Andes. You know, so you might have you know, a dry valley, you know, picture pretty wet forest, but then you come to a valley that's almost like desert-like. Well, those birds that are occurring in there, you know, they're pretty isolated from any of their relatives. And so that's another good place to look for, for new diversity. But, you know, there's still lots of just regular places to go down there and, and search. It's so much unexplored. Other question? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is, are birds a source of viruses? And uh, no, definitely not. No. <laughs> Just kidding. No, th there is, uh, you know, of course, avian influenza that's a well-known, um, you know, zoonotic, you know, a virus that everyone saw makes the jump from chickens to, to humans for sure. And so um, uh, it seems like, you know, the real bad ones are more in the world of mammals. So <laughs> let's stick with the birds. Yes. Okay. Great question. Are there any unique birds in Baton Rouge? You're living in one of the best places to go bird watching. Uh, and, you know, this time of year, you know, so in the winter, that's when you've got birds coming down from north doesn't the don't breed here i don't advocate this but go out to the lakes after a hurricane you didn't all right yeah this is not thing that's being recorded but after you know your house is okay and you know and safe to travel all the local birders we go to the lakes why because the birds that are on the coast are at the lake. So you can see things like a sooty tern that breeds offshore and, and that kind of stuff. But just, you know, what I would do, if you're interested in birding, uh, go to the Baton Rouge Audubon Society. They got a great um, web page. They just opened a new sanctuary in the Amy River. Uh, I mean, we have fantastic breeding birds here. I mean, one of the things that really got me hooked on bird watching early on, go to the coast, like, um, Grand Isle, once it's recovered, during spring migration. So the birds will leave the Yucatan Peninsula that are migrating back, they leave at dusk, they fly all night, they're exhausted, they land on the Louisiana coast. I mean, there's just birds dripping off the trees on the coast of all sorts of species that you've never seen. I mean, um, I mean, when you see 30 species of warbler 
it's like a religious experience i mean <laughs> it's unbelievable you know um it's a real spectacle yeah yeah so i think your question is about migration right and sort of why some birds migrate and some don't and that's a really good question um a lot of the birds uh, that breed in louisiana are what we call neotropical migrants and you know we sort of claim them as north american birds but they really spend most of their life in central or south america they'll come up here to breed they'll fly up in you know late April, something like that, spend a few months nesting, and then they fly back in the fall. And it's really, you know, so that, that's, you know, a whole slew of diversity of neotropical migrants, each one with its own separate biology. Some will winter in the Amazon basin, some will winter in the Andes of Colombia, some winter in the Caribbean. It's very species specific. And, and there's a lot of, um, I would say, open questions about why birds migrate. You know, I mean, Louisiana is a pretty mild climate year round most of the time. Why not just stay here? You know, there's probably insects around to eat. But um, anyway, it's a good question. There's a lot of research that needs to be done. Yeah. So the question is related to climate change in birds. Um, well, we know from, uh, there's a famous um, study in California called the Grinnell transect where you know, basically, what year was that, Chris, when they did the original transect? Yeah, 1900. So they, they went and sampled, you know, they knew along an elevational transect all of the species that, that occurred there. Well, fast forward, climate has warmed up. You're now missing those those species, those cooler adapted species that occurred at the top. So it's, I mean, it's, it's really happening. You know, there's, there's lots of effect. What can we do about it? I mean, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> just, we can, uh, someone needs to invent something to prevent it from happening, you know, cause it, it all looks pretty grim to me. It's not my area of research, but you know, you know, I think the little things we do can can help, but good question. Sorry, I don't have a good answer for that one. Matthew. So the question is, is there any evidence of speciation directly related to human activity? Um, I don't, uh, oh God, I always hate to say no, because there's probably some example, but I, I can't think of one. Yeah, but yeah. So one other example did pop into my head. This manuscript is currently under review, so please don't mention anything. But it's um, it's basically an sort of an artifactual way of creating new species through human activity. Something we call speciation by extinction. So just imagine that you have um, imagine that. The cardinal, okay, that I showed earlier, just naturally over, and forget the isolated population, let's just imagine the eastern one, okay, a big continuous distribution. And let's say they're red in Louisiana, and the further north you go, and they become bluer and bluer until you get up to uh, northern Canada, and they're just like bright blue. And everything in between is a gradient, all right? So a systematist would go, okay, well, that's one variable species. Okay, it just, it varies geographically. All right, so now let's imagine that um, some person comes along and like uh, just kills all the ones in the middle so that all you're left with is the blue and the red. At that point, they're perfectly distinct from each other they may not even recognize each other because they're so far apart. So that is speciation by extinction. And that actually has happened in a, um, a beetle uh, species in uh, Connecticut where there was um, some geographic variation of it and a land developer cleared out the middle part and you were left with two species. 
it's yeah we make a, a special point of going this is not like the kind of speciation we want to create biodiversity this is a bad thing yeah Yeah, domestication is huge, you know, I mean, I, and not nah, because, you know, think about, you know, a poodle and a Doberman, you can cross those, no problem, you know, it's really just um, manipulating a few sort of phenotypic genes, and you can do it very quickly with artificial selection, so. Yes, sir, Hoffa. Caleb, you got a question. Oh no, he needs to get up there. Well, there has been absolute, there's been little to no evidence that birds split off from their like dinosaurs in the late Permian, like crocodiles did. Like you look at stuff like in the Permian and even into the early Triassic, there's stuff like Protosuchus, which looks a lot like a crocodile. And it's, and you have dinosaurs splitting off into stuff like small archosaurs like Euparcaria. And then you have the crocodilian splitting off into larger animals. They were dominant in the Triassic. You have the Ryosuchians like Postosuchus, which was 20 feet long. And then you got the dinosaurs with Coelophysis and Platyosaurus, which were, Platyosaurus was huge, but Coelophysis was like this little sort of just scavenger, small animal predator. But I, there's been nothing that says birds split off from dinosaurs in the Triassic or anything like that. Thank you, Caleb. <laughs> Now I always wondered, I was like, uh, God, I hope he starts looking at birds one day. <laughs> Turns out the dinosaurs are birds. So, you know, it's pretty cool. So is the um, bird clade sort of the best developed phylogeny, sort of tree of life of any sort of big group of animals or plants? Um, Probably so, you know, so because we got such a leg up, you know, there's been people collecting bird tissues for 50 years. So we had a huge advantage from that. I think the um, probably the angiosperm crowd, the flowering plants, they've got a pretty nice looking um, tree of life. Uh, of course, they've got a lot more diversity. So um, I think Oh God, I should, you know, I think we've got, you know, we'll be able to have probably the first complete tree of life of any major group of organisms at this scale. And sort of cringe saying that because there's probably some exception that I'm missing out there. But I'll go out on a limb. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, what is a major group? So, you know, 11,000 species or so. Yes. Question is, are there any birds that are colorblind? Um, that is a question I don't know the answer to. The only thing I can tell you is that uh, probably not only are there aren't any blind ones, but they can actually see more of the, of the spectrum. So they have a, um, a fourth cone that allows them to see into the ultraviolet range. And so, there are people at the museum, grad students uh, studying this. And it's pretty remarkable because you can take a, you know, a parrot or something, look at it, and then look at it under ultraviolet light, and it might have a, a completely different like barring on the face or something that you couldn't see at all before. So the birds are out there seeing sort of like bees, you know, they're seeing a very different color space than we are. What I don't know is, you know, I'm thinking of like night birds, you know, maybe, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't, any, any, what? Oh, kiwis, yeah, I don't, I thought they had color vision, but they can see. 
Yeah, so possibly a Kiwi. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So the question is, so the you're from Canadian Rockies or somewhere up there where there's okay, yeah, and you, you've observed some very richly colored northern cardinals, beautiful red, and you're wondering if one of those made its way down here to Louisiana, where we have sort of a drab or cardinal, if it might uh, do pretty well down here for itself. That's a good question. Now, what I don't think, so they're not especially migratory, but let's say they were. I would say that's plausible. So I'll give you a little vignette. So for my dissertation, I studied golden collared and white collared mannequins. Okay, these are birds in Panama. Male of one is white, yellow the other. And what we found is that the female of the white plumage species actually preferred to mate with the male of the yellow plumage species. Why is sort of unclear, but presumably it, it um, you know, sort of triggered some sort of latent, <laughs> you know, I don't know exactly, you know, it, there's a lot of hypotheses about it, but that does happen. In fact, there's a whole field of um, sort of mate choice in birds where the idea is you know that something novel is desirable so yeah i think you got a hypothesis there <laughs> all right thank you let's give a big round of applause for dr brumfield that was great so just, just one quick story and we'll wrap up. When I first moved here, or actually when I was first dating my, my soon-to-be wife, I was driving into campus and I saw, I, I'm not a bird person, okay? I saw, I, grew, I saw seagulls growing up on the West Coast, that was it. Um, and uh, I was driving by the lake and I saw this, this jet black bird with bright red stripes on their wing. And I thought, wow, what a wonderful bird. And I knew that my wife would know what kind of bird it was. And you, of course, know where this is going. And I called her up and I said, hey, I just saw this amazing black bird with red stripes. What's it called? Well, it's a red-winged blackbird. So that's my knowledge of birds. So thank you. That was great. Thanks very much. Um, so tonight's winner is Ellen Ogden. Is Ellen still here? Okay, thank you all so much for coming. Was this, was this fun? Was it good to be back? Okay, are you gonna be back next, next month? So next month on March 29th, we're gonna hear from Karen Marushka, who's gonna talk about how animals communicate and how we communicate about animals. I look forward to seeing you all next month Happy Mardi Gras, be safe, be well. We'll see you then. Thank you very much. <laughs>